incredible scene. It was 4th of July. And of course, it's, that's not a you know, holiday there. So we, we were working and we were shooting uh, an opera scene. The camera was behind the stage, over the singers and, and, and dancers, seeing the whole theater full of audience, you know. So we had like 500 extras there. And so I said, roll it, playback. And suddenly, instead of Mozart's music, American national anthem starts to play. And out of the flies came this huge American flag and been unrolled, unfurled on the stage. And 600 Czechs <laughs> stood up and sang the, uh, the national anthem of the United States and knew the words. I get goose pimples when I think about it. All the extras stood up and either sang or hummed the Star Spangled Banner with us. All stood up except 30 men and women standing, panic on their face, looking at each other what they should do. They thought the secret police dispersed it among the extras, you know. And I was sitting there thinking, good God, the army's going to come and we're all going to go to jail. Because this is like, this is an act of rebellion. It started when we crossed the border. We just were in customs, and they said, OK, you can go on. Milo said to me, you're now in Czechoslovakia. Forget logic. I learned that we are going to see a play about a composer. And I, th I thought, I thought I'm going to faint, you know. Milos made a, a great fuss and said, oh no, I hate biographies of musicians and that kind of thing. I loathe it. No, I'm not coming. I saw so many, you know, in communist countries, they love to make movies about composers because composers don't talk. They make music. They don't say anything subversive. And uh, they were the most boring films I ever saw. So I was prepared for a you know, painful evening. The curtain went up and there is this wonderful drama. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was introduced to Milos in the interval. Peter was very nervous. I met him for the first time that night. And he said to me, with the marvelous directness that characterizes him, if the first, if the second act is as good as the first, I will make a movie of it. I uh, called Mr. Zanz, only to find out that he already had the name of the play or the, on his list what to see. And that's uh, how it all started. I thought it was a great play. The play really worked for me. I said, uh, he said, well, what about a picture? I said, uh, it's not a picture. I don't think it's a picture. I said, there's not enough about Mozart for me. And then Milos hit me on the arm. I still have the bruises, even though that was 20 years ago. He said, uh, that's right, it needs music, Mozart, and music. And Miros invited me up for the weekend to his uh, house in Connecticut. And he was just as forthright then. We spent an extraordinary weekend in which he said to me, uh, you realize that everything will be different. In a theater, everything is stylized. You know, nobody pretends that the tree is a real tree or the sunset is a real sunset, you know? So uh, even the language, when it's stylized, it's proper. Acting is a little exaggerated and stylized and it's proper. You know, film is a photography. In photography, everything is real. Anything stylized would feel, you know, fake. What we ended up doing was spending four months together in his house in Connecticut, Monday to Friday. We were locked into what we came finally to regard as our prison. And he, then we would go back to New York 
on, on the Friday and instantly separate, not exchange a word, for a blissful Saturday and blissful Sunday till the evening when he would come to, to here to my flat to collect me and drive me back to prison for the next uh, un almost unendurable five days when we slowly hammered out the whole script moment by moment. They had some uh, bumpy bumps in the road along the way. I spoke to both of them at different times, and both uh, uh, used terms that you don't use a mixed company about each other. <laughs> well, uh, no, no, we had a no, we had a big conflict, you know, big conflict because I hated his cooking and he hated my cooking. I regarded ourselves, both of us, as the the odd couple. On the other hand, we had an enormous advantage to have the music before. So that we, uh, for example, every day we spend like a couple of hours, you know, just listening to uh, the music, to Mozart's music, and then picking up pieces which would fit here or would fit there. And uh, that humbled every, that humbled Peter Schaeffer. The music humbled Peter Schaeffer. Suddenly, you know, you start to play music and you start to say the lines, and Peter himself was saying, no, 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 stop talking, stop talking. I said to Milos that I did not want repetitions. I did not want the Mozart theme. I did not want pe one piece of music. That it was not in the background cueing the emotion we should feel, but it was in fact the, the foreground. Peter one day, Peter Schaeffer one day said, listen, the music is becoming the third character of this film. I think possibly the first film that has music as its leading character. We met in the airport in New York to discuss it, Peter, Milos and Solzens. And they proposed this as a project. I mean, I had less than an hour to think about it because I was moving on to catch another plane from another airport. And immediately, apart from being slightly flattered that, that, that uh, they thought of me, uh, I thought of it as a project which, so long as it didn't develop into a sort of Hollywood scenario, uh, I would be very interested in. And he said, I would, under one condition, that no one note of Mozart will be changed. You have our word. We had no idea what the uh, the film was going to look like. Uh, although I knew the play, I'd seen the play, I knew that uh, once Milos got his, his hands on it, uh, f that it would be a completely different animal. We are rolling in standby, Mr. And action any time, please. Yeah, uh, let's, let's start again. Let's give him some water, because... All right, that's, uh, that's, yeah, it's fine. Casting is enormously important because that's finally whom the audience sees. You know, my ideas or writer's ideas means nothing if what I see on the screen I don't believe. It was an interesting situation because a lot of big names wanted to play, especially Salieri and Mozart, right? And uh, I somehow felt that I don't want to see known faces. I want to, people to see Mozart and Salieri. Both Saul and, uh, and Peter, you know, agreed, no, we don't need stars, we don't need big names. We have Mozart and his music, and we believe in the movie. Mozart was tough to cast. This man had written his first concerto at the age of four. His first symphony at seven. A full-scale opera at 12. Did it show which one of them could he be? When you look at the portraits of Mozart from the time, you will know this interesting thing. None looks like the other. He must have been very nondescript face that you wouldn't notice him in the crowd at all. So. He couldn't be a leading man type, you know, leading hero type. On the other hand, 
he has to be a wonderful actor, and he has to master the music. He was very hard on me, and he was quite gentle with the others. And then in the process, I learned um, on one day I spent maybe six to eight hours in a screen test. Every 20 minutes, other actors came in, and I just played opposite them all day long. And so I got to watch uh, Milos working. Okay. Every 20 minutes with a different actor or different set of actors. Very good. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's, it doesn't matter. Fine. You still have a problem. Oh, I will. That's all right. That's and right. then I began to understand that the people who I was assuming he, would, he was most interested in, um, because it was clear from their work, uh, he was also treating the same way as he treated me. And the people who you felt it just that wasn't going to be the the right combination thank you thank you was my pleasure. those are the people that that uh there was a much more gentler relationship with i think we auditioned over a thousand people for all the parts i think the number we had at one time was 1263 and we weren't finished i know we someone ran a tally about the uh, we were not finished i'm sure we passed maybe close to 1400. it seemed like i was auditioning for a year in retrospect, what we were really, do, really doing was rehearsing. I wasn't actually auditioning anymore. I, I guess I was rehearsing. <laughs> I thought I was still working to get the part. But, uh, you know, in that time, I thought, this is a wonderful project, and he's a great director, and I'm really, really lucky to be still here. Of course, you start uh, with the main characters, and uh, then you go down, but uh, down doesn't mean less important. I think uh, that the small, uh, you know, parts, you know, bit parts, are as important as the main uh, characters. In a certain way, I am paying even more attention to uh, casting the small bit parts because they have to be, you know, once you see them, you will never forget them. Because no, nothing drives me more crazy when, I, when I'm watching a film and somebody appears, you know, and then disappears for 20 minutes and then reappears, and he looks like the one, the guy who was just there, and I'm, you know, who, who is he, who, who, is, who is she, you know? Milos called me and said, Winnie, I would like very much for you to be in my movie Amadeus. It is not a very big part, but I would love you very much to be in it. One day, I was reading F. Murray Abraham for a small part in the movie. And he was all right. And then I had a young actor coming for reading for Mozart. And I asked F. Murray, listen, would you just help me here? You know, this is just, you know, to help and uh, read Salieri to this young, young, young man. And F. Murray, probably because, you know, that's, now it doesn't matter, gave wonderful performance. I did uh, one of the things from Salieri, uh, and uh, then I stopped and said to him, oh, Milos, this is where he becomes the old man in the script, which I hadn't really worked on. And he said, well, do the old man. And I just did the old man. I didn't think I, for sure I wasn't going to get this thing, but I still acted my, my heart out, you know. He read so beautifully that it started to bug me, you know. A couple of days later, he called and he said, I want you to, to know that you're my first choice. And I've been around for a while, you know, and I, uh, I said, well, that's nice. I, I'm very happy about it, but what does that mean? You see, he wasn't saying, you've got the part, or I really want you to do it, and there's no question about it. And he said, you're my first choice. Now, from my point of view, that doesn't pay the rent. I mean, I'm very flattered. And I said, thank you, Milos. Just tell me what I have to do next, because I'm busy right now painting my kitchen. Some time went by, and then he said, uh, they want to see you for the, 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 this improv group again. It's different people. I said, no, I'm telling you. I'm not going to do it. Milos said, that's the kind of guy who would be uh, Salieri. And I said, why do you say that? He said, well, he thinks he's not going to be happy about what I say now, Milos or Murray. He says, uh, this kind of guy thinks he would be a great actor if he didn't have breaks against him. Also, I think he's Salieri off stage as well as on stage. You know? And uh, he was right. So after several weeks, you know, I told F. Mary Abraham, okay, you'll get the part. He obviously didn't believe me because he immediately accepted a role in another film. While I was on the set of Scarface, I got the word that I was going to do Amadeus. 
And everyone's attitude, the stars on the show, changed toward me immediately. I was no longer just this hardworking good actor named F. Murray Abraham, like so many other hardworking good actors. I was the man who got the part that every actor in the English language was trying to get. And I was really scared, just scared, because I had, I had talked the talk, and now I had to walk the walk. And it was, it was, a, I, for three days, I couldn't answer the phone. I, I was, I was just sucking it up, getting ready for the, for the thing, for the mountain. This film could have been shot only in three towns, uh, three cities, you know, Vienna, Budapest, or Prague, because only these three cities have the same style of 18th century architecture. Prague was ideal. Prague was absolutely ideal because, uh, thanks to communist inefficiency, you know, the, the 18th century was uh, untouched, untouched. Prague was an amazing time capsule. You could set up a camera just about everywhere without having to undo a lot of uh, signs of the 20th century. They just weren't there. There was no advertising. There was no, I mean, basically, you, you removed the electric street lights. You were in the 18th century. A lot of the locations, all you had to do was throw some dirt down, put a couple lanterns with some oil in it, and you were ready to go. You have squares and streets. You can turn the camera 360 degrees around, and uh, you don't have to change anything. It's an exquisitely beautiful city. I don't think there is any other city in Europe that, that uh, has such an extensive, uninterrupted core of 18th century structures. For me, it was a very mixed, uh, you know, emotional experience because um, I was not allowed to go back. You know, I was a traitor, an immigrant. So when I went there for the first time, which was more or less to, you know, negotiate the making of the movie, that was very emotional for me because, you know, before I didn't hope that I will ever see you know, my native country and places where I kissed my first girlfriend, you know, ever again in my life. And then I was coming back to Prague uh, for the shooting. I remember I was arriving January 2nd, very cold, snow everywhere. And, uh, and I realized that, you know, from now on, I have to cut myself uh, emotionally from my past entirely because otherwise you know, the work would suffer. When I got to Prague, in the beginning, as you remember, of Amadeus, um, there's the scene where his assistant uh, coming with the muffins and Vincent Schiavelli in snow. And so I had written like a 13-page snow alert in English and on the back in Czech. I wanted trucks rigged. I wanted lighting packages. I wanted duplicate equipment. I wanted road maps. They got this thing, and they said, what are you talking about? Half the people don't have phones. We don't have trucks that we can let sit in the sideline. So I said, very simple, just tell me when it's going to snow. <laughs> we didn't have still the weather reports as perfect as we have today. So, uh, well, there might be snow. So there was always a snow alert. They phoned at one point and said, there's no snow. It's not going to snow this year. The long-term weather report says we're not going to have any snow. We're not going to shoot you until the end of March. We're going to shoot with fake snow. I said, okay, so you're free, you can do, you can take other work. Every day we had to prepare two sets, one for in case there is overnight snowfall and one in case there is not, you know. And uh, so, but as well, that was not my problem. That was not my problem. I didn't, I didn't want him to know about it. I was engaged to do an episode of Taxi on, on Monday and Saul called on Thursday, the Thursday before, and said, it's snowing. Can you come now? <laughs> I said, yeah, he said, I know, I know, you got to be back in L.A. We'll get you back on Monday. So I said, sure. He said, you know, we'll just do the one exterior shot in the snow, and then you'll come back in a couple of weeks, and we'll do the interiors. I said, okay. So I got on a plane Thursday night, and I got to Prague Friday night, and we shot Saturday night, and uh, I was back for Monday. I had never been to a Soviet bloc country before, and going to one at such a fantastically accelerated rate of speed 
my first impressions were enormous and huge. I felt like I was in a B, a, a, a B rate, you know, a, a grade B spy movie. Followed everywhere. Hotel rooms bugged. There were sizable rooms in this one hotel, and they all were very ornate with a chandelier and these sconces and rugs, kind of worn, chipped, and tacky, but the fact is that they were there, you know? And this one guy, Frank, <laughs> he said, these guys have got this room bugged. I said, who cares? Let them listen. He said, no, man, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to listen. I'm going to let them listen to me. I'm going to knock that. I think, oh, what are you going to make a problem? No, listen, I want to show you. So he starts climbing around. The sconces, no. Looks at the, it's the chandelier. He looks at the He gets up on a chair. He's climbing around. Now it's not here. And I said, let it go. Let's go to dinner. Let's, no, I want to find it. He said, ah, he rolls the rug back and he finds a plate about this big with two screws in it. He said, I told you, man, it's right here. He gets a, a butter knife. We had a little kitchen hats, right? He gets a butter knife. He takes it out takes the final screw out, and as he takes the last screw out, there's this tremendous crash, and the chandelier <laughs> beneath us crashes down in the apartment below us. We went to dinner in it like a shot. A friend of mine, a, um, an older Czech director named Yiddy Weiss, gave me some um, uh, pineapples and lemons for his daughter. And we met, she came to the set that Saturday night, and I had the lemons and the oranges, or the, the oranges and the pineapples and the lemons. And I gave her this stuff. And half the crew was secret police. And everybody knew it. And afterwards, I don't remember his name, but he was sort of smarmy cop. Obviously cop. He said, so tell me, so what is this, this woman you meet, this intrigue in Prague? What is this? And I played like idiot. And I said, oh, She's the daughter of a roommate of a friend of mine who's from here, used to make movies here. Anyway, he asked me if I would bring his daughter some pineapples and some lemons. And he said, pineapple? And I had learned the Czech word for pineapple. It's ananas. It's the same word as in French. I said, yes, ananas. And he said, ah, yes, in the can. I said, no, no, real, uh, fresh ananas. Fresh pineapple? Fresh ananas? <sighs> and then for the next 20 minutes, I watch it go around the set. And they're all doing the same gesture at the end of the exchange. They're going, in the can. And the teller of the story says, no, fresh ananas. And they all kind of, and looked at me and kind of, <sighs> I think they were the only two pineapples in Prague that January. When they go down the corridor of the insane asylum, that was a war museum. The central uh, hall where all the mad people were kept was part of a military hospital for the wounded from the Thirty Years' War. It was a funny situation because the communists took it over. They left only the ground floor uh, as a kind of a museum, but was closed for the public. And up in the second and third floor were a secret archive of the secret police. Well, that was a panic when, you know, uh, they learned that they showed us the, you know, the, uh, ground floor corridors. We were questioned very closely as to what our connections were. We could be, for after all, we could be CIA members or we could be whatever. And uh, they didn't much like the idea of us, a film company invading uh, the military archive. But we managed to persuade them. When we went there for the first time, that corridor had 75 two-ton cannons all looking at each other. And Milo says, I love it. I said, yeah, I love it too. Uh, what are we going to do with these 200, you know, 2,000 pound cannons? Oh, he says, oh, the cannons can't be there. Oh, I said, well, I figured that out already, that the cannons can't be there. But, you know, can you, you know what? We're going to have to get all of these cannons out 
and you want the pristine snow, no snow can have anybody's footprints on it, and then we got to get these cannons out. Well, I listen, I, I didn't know it's a problem, you know. So there are some cannons there, really right? take them away. You know, I, I didn't know that every cannon <laughs> weighs several tons, you know. <laughs> they have to hire the whole army to take it out. The first three weeks of shooting was Salieri in the hospital room. I was the uh, guy that went out with him in the morning, and Dick Smith, who was our makeup artist, at 4 o'clock in the morning, every morning, for four hours of makeup before the crew came. And you go out to Barandoff, you know, no one is there at 4 o'clock in the morning, and the minute you get there, where's my tea, you know? <laughs> well, you know, I just got out of the car, Murray, you know, I'm going to go get your tea. Dick Smith is the best makeup man in the world, and uh, when we would start working in the morning, it was uh, four o'clock. I would get up, I'd get to the studio by 4.30. We'd work on the makeup for four and a half hours. As m much preparation as I had made for the old man, the voice, the gestures, and so on, the fact is that after sitting for four and a half hours at that hour in the morning, you are kind of tired and slow and... Your movements are kind of like this. This kind of thing starts to happen. And I also had lenses in my eyes, which every once in a while had to be removed, and my eyes had to be sprayed with stuff, so that the uh, pain, which was always there when I was working, would not be too much. Once I looked into a mirror at my face, I felt like it was completely convincing. All I had to do was believe this guy, and it was not hard. I'm not denigrating my work. I'm a very proud actor. But with a man like Dick Smith there, and with the words of Peter Schaffer, which are, they've got to be the most beautiful descriptions of music ever written, whether on film or in literature. This was a music I'd never heard. And the fact that we can hear the music accompanying the words. Filled with such longing, such unfulfillable longing. But what more can you ask for? It seemed to me that I was hearing the voice of God. Excuse me. Because of the way the uh, schedule went, the first thing that was filmed in the shooting schedule was all of, of Salieri Old. That sort of breathtaking section of um, Murray's performance, most breathtaking, um, uh, was all done in the first couple of weeks. But it gave us the time to work uh, on our own we rehearsed a lot on our own. We rehearsed all of the scenes before the filming began. Initially, Meg Tilly was playing Constanza in the film, and she was amazing. Basically, at one point, Milos had said he felt like we had done it, do you know, because the work was going so well um, up to that point. And the day before... Meg was to appear on camera for the first time. Um, uh, she got hurt in a in a soccer game. She's uh, playing soccer with some kids in the in the in the street, and she torn the ligament in her leg so badly that uh, the doctors told us that uh, we would have to wait like five weeks before she could start, and that we couldn't because. Uh, it was all independent money which was all put together and uh, we just couldn't afford it. It was shocking, I think partially because we were where we were, behind the Iron Curtain in its way, uh, cut off in a way from our lives to a significant degree, more than if we had been shooting in Western Europe or um, someplace closer to home. Suddenly she was just gone and in a hospital so in a very short amount of time, they had to find um, the actress who would take over the part. The casting director who was brought on to hire the new Constanza, this woman called my, an acting teacher of mine and said, do you, do you have anybody you can recommend for the part? And he said, Elizabeth Barrage. And she said, oh, no, she's, she's too weird and introverted. And, and, uh, and <clears throat> She's too quirky for this outgoing bubbly girl, which I was. Um. <laughs> we flew to New York for a weekend, and um, it was extraordinary. Friday night, we went Prague, Paris, 
and Saturday morning, we took the Concorde to New York. So we got there, went to Milos's apartment, and they had 60 some odd girls lined up for us to see. I saw like 60 girls. Sunday, I read like 12 of them. Out of these 12, two were, I couldn't decide in between them, so uh, so decided, let's bring them to Prague and let's uh, you know, do a screen test with them in Prague. It felt like calamitous to me. It felt like it had gone so badly. And I remember saying to my father, if I can't even speak, you know, how am I going to get a part acting ever? Because speaking is required in that line of work. And, um, and then I got a call saying, you're, you're flying to Czechoslovakia for a test, a screen test, and there's you and another contender. And so and I, there was, I had no passport, and this was, I think, the next day. Milos went back to Prague Sunday so he could shoot on Monday. And I went over there on Monday, went back with the two girls on Monday. And that was uh, some ushering job with two girls who were up for the same part being with them. I kept saying, I love you both, I love you both. We were flown over and we tested. And they had us all, they did the hair and the makeup, and meanwhile they're filming the, the movie and it's all like you really want to not feel, uh, start to feel like you're part of the thing. Because, you know, in my case, I knew I was getting back on a plane the next day. And apparently the, they couldn't decide that first day. So they said, well, well there's going to be another test tomorrow. So we came back and went through all the the do's and the gowns and and this went on for a week and the other woman and I hung out every night and would have dinner and I was always a nervous wreck and she would say no I'm sure you look lovely and that that wig they had you and I was like oh I'm sure you you did great <laughs> and I was um preparing to like okay how do I say thank you for having me and for considering me and for this nice trip First class ticket to Prague. I thank you so much and bye. And good luck with your movie. And and <laughs> and Milos said, uh, essentially, you both have the part. You know, uh, it's 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 impossible to decide between you. So I had to go with the fact that one of you is simply too pretty <laughs> to play Constanza. So Elizabeth, you have the part. And <laughs> and I was like, thanks. That's uh, well, I have the part. That's good. As much as I love McTilly, I think uh, as a as a personality, Elizabeth Elizabeth Berry, uh, Berich was uh, more right because she Constanza was a landlady's daughter. She was a street kid, you know. So I got the booby prize and 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 had to stay and had packed clothes probably for three days and. There I was for six months in, in Prague and started work the next day. And that was it. I was Constanza. From Mozart? I remember the, fir the first day, the first scene that I shot was the Nipples of Venus scene where I come to see Salieri. And, and I had eat like about a million and, and a half of those. Go on, try one. They're quite surprising. And I, marzipan is foul. I don't, it's just an mm. awful, awful. And I remember getting ill, and, and Milos was like, ah, it's her job. But wasn't exactly having to work in a coal mine, but, but eating a million marzipan balls can... <sighs> Maybe I didn't know I didn't have to eat the whole thing. No, you know, that was another thing that 20 years old, I didn't know, oh, you can spit it out at the end of... I don't know, so... Oh, we're going again, okay. Um, and it's funny how that can be the only thing that's on your mind, <laughs> and I couldn't, I had to, it's like, oh. <laughs> They're wonderful. <laughs> the first scene that I actually did in the actual making of the movie was the March of Welcome, meeting Mozart for the first time. Very good, Majesty. I had to learn to play the piano not only uh, accurately, but badly. Even though the harpsichord, the piano was unhooked, you just, in case you were seeing the hands, it had to be in the right place. Lightly, then strongly. They had provided me with several different versions of pre-recorded music, and I had to learn to do it as recorded, which was fun, actually. I had a good time, and I got to be very good at it. Tom worked on it, too. Tom 
had a piano in his room, and, and he worked on it all the time. The keyboards that I played on in front of the camera were all silent. All of the music was recorded before we started, so the sequence was either done with the music being played out loud in the room, or in my ear if there was dialogue that had to go on. In the scene where Mozart first meets the emperor and Salieri has written this march, it was such a surreal experience because the scene was staged so the actors were behind me. The keyboard is here. Because there's dialogue, the only music is being played in a tiny little transistor in my ear. The keyboard is silent. I'm looking away so that if, you know, when you lose your bearings, you can't find it because you can't hear anything. So it truly was a kind of schizophrenic situation. When we met, the only instrument he ever played was guitar. He never played piano. But he was spending like three, four hours a day for several months practicing the piece, just the pieces which he had to play. I began, as the months went on, to actually believe the illusion a little bit, so it was always very distressing to go to my practice room and hear what I really sounded like on a, on a sounded keyboard. The practice room where I had my piano, oddly enough, was right over the room where Milos hung out. Imagine the, what a nightmare that must have been for him. The one day he made a comment about that I was improving was the day that my teacher was demonstrating to me. <laughs> Neville Mariner, after seeing the film, said uh, he never hits a wrong key, even when he plays backwards. Oh, oh! <laughs> now you play it backwards. <laughs> there was just no way to be able to do that without being able to do it. It's one thing to play on a silent keyboard to a playback, but it's something entirely different to do it upside down behind your back. In the way of stunt work, you learn what the assignment is, and you, some, you know, chemical gets released, and, and you actually can do it. It was a big thrill for everybody to realize that we were going to film in practically the only wooden opera house left in, in Central Europe, and also most perfectly uh, preserved. It had undergone many alterations, but they were of a minor nature, and architecturally the place was intact. When we first time arrived to Prague uh, for location, and they showed us uh, the theater, we were there, you know, with Peter Schaeffer and Saul, when suddenly I realized well, Peter Schaeffer disappeared. Where is Peter Schaeffer? We found him in the corridor you know, hidden, crying, because he, there he learned that he is standing exactly at the place where Mozart himself in person conducted the world premiere of Don Giovanni. I tell you, we felt awed the first time we stepped on that stage and realized that our hero had been in that very spot. I think this fact, you know, gave a lot of uh, humility and respect for that place to every actor and every dancer and everybody there. There's something that happens when you do that, I promise you, when you do it in the place, in the atmosphere. It's, I'm not crazy about, you know, spiritual, I don't know, ghosts and things. I'm not, but I don't deny them. And suddenly, the reality of the place and the thing and the moment really enters into you, which is why it was a great idea to do it there instead of trying to build the set. It was, it was brilliant. But, again, thanks to the neglect, you know, during the communist era, it was a powder keg. It was in danger of burning down at any moment. And it hadn't, it, it still had had gas lines in it. They lit it with gas. They, they had, you know, they used to have limelight in it. It really hadn't been modernized. Now we are going there to light, you know, millions of candles. All those candles in a wooden opera house and a wooden dome, when the chandeliers were lit, 
I remember holding my breath for what seemed like four days. And there we were, all these, all these extras, all these wigs and all this flammable stuff in this tinderbox dry theater where Don Giovanni had had its premiere. <laughs> that theater we were in, <laughs> amazing. Imagine the trust of the opera house allowing us to be there. We had every day like uh, 30 or 40 firemen everywhere standing there but they were absolutely i will never forget don giovanni at certain moment don giovanni moves to the table does this and he has a head with huge uh, plumage you know feather you know like a peacock feather right and leans like that and talks to the uh, you know, commodore we rehearsed Everything was fine. Okay, let's shoot. So light the candles. We didn't realize that there on the table is a small candelabra, which now is lit. Okay, camera, roll it, playback, we are shooting. <laughs> The actor for he is performing like that. He leans, and suddenly we see that this feather caught fire, and the fire is going up and up and up. But he is in the ecstasy of performing. He doesn't even notice, you know. And everybody is staring, and nobody. And we have like 40, 50 firemen around there. And his head starts, you know, be really on flames. Finally, one fireman dared to lean from the, the wings and said, excuse, excuse me, Mr. Foreman, would you please stop the cameras? Your actor is on fire. It was sick. Camera is rolling. Everything is sacred, you know. I, I was under the impression at that time, never having done a movie of that size, I had done a horror film, and just, that if things went wrong, and that 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 one should just stop. <laughs> when we <laughs> we did that scene where we're playing under the table, I don't remember if it was an actual take or a rehearsal, but I came right out of my dress, <laughs> and you know, which I was barely in to begin with, and um, <laughs> and there was Milos. Keep going. I was like, really? <laughs> Stop it! I am! Stop it! And, and Milos looks for the... He would love life coming in accidentally. There. You see? Milos, Milos can be a bit abrupt. That's kind of a, of a pleasant way to put it. But he's never wrong on Amadeus. After this incredible journey to get to Prague through the night and all of this remarkable stuff, I'm suddenly standing in 18th century costume in the snow in Prague in the middle of the night. And I have to walk around a corner and walk down the street. And he says to me, Winnie, television is ruining you. He meant my performance was terrible. My walk was terrible. Television is ruining you. And then we did a second take a moment later, and he said, that was wonderful. <laughs> I don't know what changed. We were six days or five days into shooting the first scene that I was in, and Milos wasn't really saying anything. And I, I was starting to feel a little bit more comfortable, and I said, Milos, you know, if, um, do you have any suggestions? And he said, no. I said, well, I mean, is it, is it okay? I mean, should I do more or less? Or I said, no, you're doing fine. And I said, oh, because you, you just haven't said anything. I said, well, if there was anything wrong, I would have said so. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> I was doing fine, so he didn't need to say anything. Less you talk, less you confuse actors' heads. If you cast wrong, then you have to work, and usually you're in trouble anyway. Director is little bit of everything but good director always for every you know part of his work must choose people who are better than him
for me, the operas were uh, not difficult at all, because it was, first of all, beautifully recorded, you know, beautifully cast uh, by Twyla, and she did uh, all the choreography, you know. So uh, for me, it was just a question, you know, how to, where to place the camera and how to, how to shoot it. It was extremely difficult to work in Prague. There were no materials. Uh, everything had to be brought in and everything was improvised. A sweet hot they had no properties, they had no wardrobes, they had no fabrics, they had nothing to build with, but they had an ingenuity and they had a humor and they had a force to their imagination that more than repaid the lack of materials. I, I, I really enjoyed it and I had a great fun when we were shooting the, the parody of Chica, in Chicanetta's theater, the parody of Mozart's operas. Milos only talks about doing things extremely and broadly. That is one of his charms. You cannot go over the top with Milos. It's not possible. It doesn't exist. I like that. Peter enjoyed very much writing this scene, you know, and the, 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 the parody words, uh, ly new lyrics. I'd never done anything like that before. I'm not sure Miller had ever directed anything like that before. And uh, I'm sure Twyla had never choreographed anything like that before. I'm sick to death of that tune! It was a pure joy, you know, we just put every silly thing in, you know, the dwarves. It's very inventive scene, it's very Milos Forman scene. You feel it in the man. The thing that gives him the greatest pleasure is, is that kind of theatre. The, the guy who is in the, in the back of the horse, right, because he has to reach out and give out the uh, when the horse moved he had to walk backwards i'll tell you that was probably the most difficult thing in the film there were so many extras um we were hard pressed for enough wigs and enough costumes makeup and hair and wardrobe for 500 people uh it was like a um you know it was like a battleground once these hundreds of people were dressed, they were sort of on their own, and uh, they wandered the halls and ate their lunch and, and uh, made phone calls, and all in their clothes. I think that had a tremendous amount to do with the way they came across. It was life. They lived in these clothes for, for as long as it took to complete the scene just as they did in the 18th century. And I think there is a, a great deal of authentic life in, in them and in the clothes. They were in the clothes long enough that they were not a costume. They were their own. Ten jistý úspěch, který třeba ty kostýmy dostaly jenom proto, že jsem... I think the costumes in the film succeeded because I had a hard head. When I didn't like something, I had it redone again and again until it was right. I didn't allow even the producer to interfere with me when it was costing more money. I'd redo it and redo it until I'd say that can go in front of a camera. The worst thing is to compromise because it compromises the entire production. It's every woman's fantasy, I think, in some for, for about five minutes to wear something like that and feel like a, you know, a princess or... And then, and then it gets old. It's very <laughs> uncomfortable and you're like... I was, it was literally like being squeezed and, and coming out at the top like, a, like toothpaste. <laughs> 18th century costumes, uh, you know, it really, it really informs 
how you stand, how you walk, how, what your posture should be. Uh, 18th century clothes have very, very tight shoulders. They keep you, they keep you back. You keep your shoulders back and keep your head erect. That's, that's the pose. That was the look of the time, and that's what the clothes tell you they want you to do. The thing that surprised me that happened was that because my uh, hair had gotten dyed a kind of uh, uh, gold color, um, I would get up in the morning and just the image of that was so different to me that it actually triggered the part of me that was more extroverted. <laughs> As people would show up for their various sequences in the film, um, I found that I, I had an urge to, you know, take them out and to be the kind of uh, social director and, and uh, in, in a way that isn't my natural inclination. He was so much in the, in the head of Mozart. After the movie was wrapped, we ended up sharing a, a, a living space together, and he was a very different man than he was. <laughs> he was transformed into Mozart. I hadn't thought about this in a long time. But as Salieri, I was separate from the rest of the cast for the first three and a half weeks because I was only doing the old man. And I had decided to be separate from the cast because that's the kind of man Salieri was. I'm not that way. I love parties. I love a good time. I really do. Good jokes. But I was extremely solitary. It was me against everyone else. What I didn't realize was that this was infecting the way the other cast members felt about me. There began to be a separation. Whenever there were parties, I wasn't invited because I, first of all, wasn't there. I was in another hotel. But also, I was always too busy. So if you were fused for three and a half, four weeks, people don't invite you anymore, as you can well imagine. So what happened was I began to be like that character. I didn't like the idea of being separate. But, in a way, that really contributed a great deal to the success of the performance. In some way, I feel like the um, working relationship that I had with Murray was uh, supported by the fact that we didn't become such close friends that we knew too much about each other. Tom and I have great respect for each other. We like each other. But during the film, we did not... We were living a little bit like those two characters. There was always that element where we never knew each other so well as people that we could tell exactly when the other one was telling the truth or not. It happens. When you, when you embody a character as we did, it happens that you carry it over. He said to give you this. It sounds crazy a little bit, but it's true of any actor who does a part for a length of time. And of course, these parts meant so much to both of us. It was only right that we had this, this, uh, this slight antagonism. It's too soon. Can I? Could I help you? Would you? The dictation of the Requiem by the dying Mozart seems to me to overturn every uh, piece of wisdom I was ever told. The, the words and them in themselves not particularly interesting. They don't even look as if they're uh, a movie script. They look as if they are, I mean, they will never play. They sort of dull, C sharp, E flat, uh, bar 14, this, that, the other. You know, it's uh, several pages of musical direction. One guy's in bed and the other is writing at the end. And nobody moves. It's a very daring thing to do, to have a whole sequence where composers are dictating music to each other. And um, they had set us up before we started filming with Neville Mariner and his assistant, and they had them do the scene for us to give us an idea of what real musicians would be like. And um, forgive me, Neville, <laughs> um, it was awful. It was awful because, you know, they're not actors. Any film school would tell you this is not a movie. Come, let's begin. We ended in F major. Yes. So now, A minor. There's one sequence early on in the scene where M Mozart is fairly delirious and trying to find the 
phrase that he's looking for in the dictation. A minor. Yes. Confutatis. A minor. In reality, what happened on that day is there's a there's a little um, uh, John Strauss is sitting in the corner pressing the buttons on a little cassette player. We have. Uh, little hearing aids in our ears which are playing in a kind of AM radio way the musical phrase so that we can be on the tempo and on the pitch that when all the music gets laid in afterwards that it's there and there was some mishap so there's a moment where I'm uh, me the actor it is uh, I'm genuinely lost but because of the kind of, of trust and and uh, uh, connection that we have the whole sequence is in the film. A minor. Start with the voices. Basses first. Second beat of the first time. Time. Common time. Second beat of the first measure. There were two cameras set up so that we didn't have to worry about overlapping. And it was as though we were in the theater. And most of that is improvisational because he was very, very acting as though he were very sick at the time. And consequently, he began to lose certain things. And I would guide him, actually. At times, he would get lost and I would help him. It was a, a real symphony between the two of us, a real duet. Later on in the scene, um, I don't know that I ever talked to Murray about this, but I would skip information. First bassoon, tenor trombones, with the tenors. I would leave out information that I knew he needed to go to the next place. Go too fast. Do you have it? Go too fast. Do you have it? First bassoon, tenor trombone, what? With the tenors. So he'd have to stop me, Identical. and that Salieri would seem like he just wasn't quite smart enough. Now, trumpets and timpani, no. trumpets and D. No, no. T listen no, to me. I don't understand. Listen. So that kind of playing that you can do because there were cameras on both of us and also because of a superb partnership between two players. <laughs> The thing that most amazed me was the artistry of every person in every job that worked on this film. And the extraordinary storytelling that happened from every point of view. I have the deepest gratitude to that crew because they gave everything, everything they had. In most cases, the film would be a biography of Mozart and it would be what happened and what happened. But to take all the circumstances of that extraordinary life and put it in the context of this other man and his argument with his God is genius, I think. I don't really care what this is about because it moves me and makes me think, it makes me laugh, it makes me cry a little, and the uh, Whatever you think about, that's what is it about. I don't see that the movie has aged. It seems it's a, it's a timeless story and it's beautifully told and it's beautifully shot. I'm sure you'll hear this again and again, uh, but uh, we were part and parcel of something that was greater than we were. I remember the stunned silence of those long, long uh, main titles at the end of the film while the piano concerto is still playing. And the extraordinary thing, and but people waited until the end of the, of the main titles. And then the, the extraordinary applause at the end, just as if they'd been to a concert. And then you got the first sense that perhaps uh, this was going to be an unusual uh, movie and that uh, perhaps the music had won. 
the thing that pleases me almost more than anything else about the whole enterprise is the number of people, young people, who discover the man I think is the greatest composer in the world. So many people uh, were introduced uh, to Mozart as a composer uh, compared with what would have happened if we'd just done it in concert halls. It would have taken us a hundred years to reach as many people as, as the film reached. 